Yeah. So it's a little bit counterintuitive, but most soils, I would say over 80%, depending, I don't know the statistics exactly, but the majority of soils will not be formed over the parent material. The rocks that originate the soil, most of the time, they are not below the soil. They are far away. So these are transported material. So we look big. To start with, we look for the rocks as understanding the properties of the, so the parent materials that will condition the soils. But rarely, mo very rarely, you see in the place where you form the soil, you see that the rock is there. Normally, the rock is far away. And how that material comes to the place where the soil is formed? By wind, water, animals, ice. All right, it's transported material. Most of the time, parent materials are transported. Most of the time they are transported and there are different ways in which these parent materials are transported. It's important for us to know what type of the parent material is there. Sometimes it's coming from uh, limestone, but still can be transported. Okay. Sometimes it's coming from igneous rocks. Yeah. Sometimes it's coming from the ophiolites, but you need to know the, the origin of the rock to understand the properties of the soil, but also how that rock was physically weathered, transported, sedimented, and then developed the soil is important for you to understand the pro properties of that soil. So parent materials, not always, most of the time, they are transported before they are allowed to form the soils. Okay? So in an ideal condition, textbook, condition, you have the soil which is disintegrating over time and forming the soil in situ, yeah? Forming the soil in situ. And there is the development of soil horizons. How many of you heard about soil horizons? The concept of soil horizons, okay? A horizon, B horizon, C horizon. So A horizon is the, what we call the topsoil, okay? Topsoil means that the ones that are being transformed by mm -hmm. organisms and are very appropriate for sustaining the growth of plants. C horizon is the one that is very similar to the original rock, the parent material. It's just fragmented. It's the regolith, yeah? In, ge in geological terms, it's the regolith. B horizon develops when you have mature soils, is where it's a layer where there is deposit of some materials. Yeah, the B horizon will have some deposit. So when you see a B horizon that is accumulation layer in the soil, is already a symptom that your soils are becoming mature, yeah, over time. So So residual parent material can be transported by different ways. So what are the ways that, based on this figure, how many different ways can you see that the materials can be transported? So here is the agent of transportation, okay? How is the agent of transportation? So it can be water transported, and depending on the type of water that is transported, you have different names. If it's water transported, if it's deposited in lakes, it's lacustrine. If deposited by streams, is alluvial or fluvial. Normally, the name is alluvial soils, okay? Deposit in oceans, marine, okay? <coughs> now, if it's gravity, it's colluvial. How? Can gravity deposit materials? Have you heard about landslides? Yeah? Landslides? Have you seen that before? Maybe if I can just search quickly here. Other example here of landslides, yeah? 
similar to an avalanche of snow, but only from rocks and mud and soil material. All right, so we have gravity making colluvial deposits, yeah? Colluvial deposits. If it's ice transported, we call it till and moraine, yeah? And then if it's deposited by water, you have outwash, lacustrine, alluvial, and marine again over here. How is that formed? Because when the glaciers are pushing that soil around, we're going to come to this on the next slide, it forms these small features, like small hills. It's pushing the soil around. And this is at the formations, that is the soil that's pushed around. But also when you have those glaciers, you form lagoons, yeah, lakes, about where with that uh, where in that type of landscape, and sometimes that lakes they break and they deposit the water uh, further below. So it becomes if it's becoming transported from the ice formations, but deposited by water, and then it's coming back to the features that you see up here. And then you have wind transport. Yeah, wind transport is very easy to see in Oman. Not that Oman has a lot of soils there deposited by wind, but Oman actually is a source of material for other landscapes to form their soils. When you look at the atmosphere here, you see that there is a lot of um, dust in the air. That dust does not stay here. As the wind goes by, it takes it to somewhere else, and somewhere else it will deposit, and there will form the soils. So we are source of parent material for the formation of soils in other regions. Let's break down. This is the formation in situ, yeah, weathering of underlying rocks. This is rare. Many, most of the times you do not see this, just in special occasions. Most of the time when you have that you see the rock already emerging in the soil, shallow soils forming over that rock will have been formed from that rock. But if you have the rest of the landscape here on the bottom, most likely those landscapes are bring uh, by deposits, yeah? Fluvial deposits or uh, other types of deposits. So colluvial means that is coming from gravity, yeah? So it's the landslides that I just showed, showed you before. And then you have this clear cut. How do you identify colluvial deposits? First of all, you are close to a very steep slope. Then you have a clear break of different uh, aspects of the parent material. You have a buried soil below, and on top of that you have a deposit where a new soil has formed. So by seeing that clear break between the two types of materials, you can then assume that if there is the slope, then that is coming from by gravity, by the landslide deposition of that material. Alluvial deposits, this is the most common one in Albatina region. Yeah? All the wadis, when you get near the coast, they have these alluvial fans. Yeah, fans because they spread out like this. You can easily see here where the wadi comes. All that area near the coast where they flood, where the wadis would flood in the past, that is the area where you deposit. Yeah, they come, they have a, a rain event, they flood that area, and then the deposit settles down. And then, over time, you have maybe in a decade you have five, six big events of flooding, and then you take that into a hundred years, a thousand years, and you build up a very thick layer of a dip, uh, deposited alluvial material. So it's very common that you see that in Albatina coast, where you have the wadis, where the slope is a little bit lower, most likely what you have there is alluvial deposits. In the soils that are formed there are usually very young soils. They are not so old because the alluvial deposits are constantly being deposited in the place. So there's not enough time for the soil to form. The weathering of the parent material could be high, even if the soil is young. Why? Maybe that material is coming from already other soils that are already well-developed. 
if other soils are well developed and then they're eroded and transported and redeposited, then that material could be already weathered. Okay? What you usually see in alluvial deposits is fine materials, mostly silt, yeah? fine sand, silt, and a little bit of clay, layered. Yeah? Why layered? When you have a flood, what comes down first? You have a water layer, it's a flooded soil. What deposits first? The sand, yeah? Then the silt. And then after a while, the clay flocculates and settles on the top of it. So always in alluvial deposits, you have that very thin layered material where you see a gradient of texture. It's coming from crays and becoming finer. And then again, crays and becoming finer. So this type of formation is a clear indication that those soils are deposited by water, you know, by fluvial deposits. So already, I don't need to show you images of flooding. We, we are very familiar with this. Even recently, the Shaheen event was very severe here in the Batina. Marine deposits. Yeah, marine deposits are deposited in the ocean. Normally, the rivers will bring all these sediments to the coast, and then those sediments will flocculate and deposit on the ocean bed. And then, by uplifting, geological uplifting, those marine deposits will come to the surface. In the Albatina region, you get a lot of that also. You, know, you have the, the, the alluvial deposits, but also a little bit more inland, you have marine deposits coming above. And they tend to be more calcareous. Yeah, the marine deposit tends to be more calcareous than the alluvial deposits because of the marine organisms and the calcium carbonate precipitation that is happening on the ocean. So the ocean bed will tend to form more calcareous deposits. If you hear, if you near the coast here of Batina, if the soil is very calcareous, most likely it's either a marine deposit or it's a alluvial deposit that was eroded from a marine deposit. So a limestone was eroded and then it was deposited by the wadis and made the new alluvial deposit. So it's already a good tell if it's the carbonate content of a soil is already a good tell of the origin of the parent material. Now transported by ice, that is uh, more foreign for uh, Oman because we don't have glaciers here. But if you travel to mountains, South America, Europe, big mountains, you will see formations like this. <laughs> These glaciers, they are rivers of ice. Yeah, rivers of ice. If you just look at it, I went and visited several glaciers in Chile. It looks that like nothing's happening. But if you put a camera and take one photograph per day and do a time lapse, you will see that the ice is moving down the hill. Sometimes, let me... The ice be, is very heavy. And below that ice, it's pushing soil. Yeah, It's dragging soil at the ice. And that makes this ice deposits. Not only that, but it's fragmenting. You know, the physical weathering by ice is very severe. If it's bringing rocks below, rocks are scratching over other rocks and being fragmented. So the physical weathering is very severe when you have this type of deposits by ice. So not only it's transporting, but also fragmenting this material. All right. Eolian. Eolian deposits are not very common in Oman, but in several countries, yes, they are. For example, there's long landscapes in China that are aeolian silt deposits. Yeah? Um, these are some examples of dust storms. Dust storms you are familiar with, but then here in Oman, most likely, you are taking this material and depositing, depositing somewhere else. Yeah? So it, they are aeolian deposits, and the main formations that you see, for example, the ones in China, they're called loess, yeah? Loess soils 
or very deep deposits that are coming by wind. Most of it is silt. Volcanic ash, I would even not classify by, by, by wind. It's just volcanic deposits. Yeah? It's a different category altogether. Volcanic deposits. But the low S is the classic example for the eolic deposits. They have very deep soils, very fertile soils, agricultural soils, mostly composed of silt that is deposited by wind. Sand dunes also can be, you know, if they're mobile sand dunes, they are uh, wind transported and deposited. These are the types of lowest hills, yeah, that you can see. And also these lowest de deposits, they, they are very stable and so you can dig and carve caves on them uh, easily underground. So you have this type of formation of that you can dig and find, you know, use it for caves most of uh, many times. One of the characteristics of Aeolian deposit is the parent material, the rocks that they originated from can be very, very far away. For example, some of the dust coming from the Sahara can deposit even in South America and Central America. They can travel far away across the globe and deposit somewhere else. The long distance deposits, more than being very important by the the mass of the soil formation, they are very important also for sharing the nutrients and making that biogeochemical cycle of the nutrients being carried far away. For example, many rocks do not have phosphorus. Plants need phosphorus for the, their nutrition. But calcareous soils from marine deposits, they have high phosphorus. If they are eroded by wind and they spread throughout the globe, now they're sharing that nutrient with other soils. They have the small mass of deposits, but that small mass of deposits could mean a lot for the nutrition of the vegetation in which they are arriving, okay? But many times they can go around the globe more than once before they, they are settled, depending on how fine they are. If they are very fine, think about when you have these volcanic activities, the ash goes around the globe dispersing and they are taking a long time for settling. Same things go for this type of storms. The finer the material, the longer they travel. Organic deposits. Yeah, organic deposits are usually formed when you have anaerobic conditions. So you have dying lakes, swamps, then is where you find and form these organic deposits. Also, these organic deposits are more typical from um, cold climates, yeah? subtropical climates. In Oman, you do not see a lot of organic deposits. First, because it's dry. Second, because it's hot. Yeah? So cold climates, very wet climates, flat landscapes where you have constantly wet situations, there is where you get these organic deposits forming. And over time, you get the thickness of, you know, 20 meters, 50 meters of formation of these organic materials. Now, when you buy that peat moss that you buy on the nurseries, you're actually, this is mine material. This is soil, organic deposit that was formed over thousands of years. And then they just go there, dig them out, sieve it and sell it for you, for your plants. Yeah? Some of the characteristics of this organic deposit is they're usually very acidic. Yeah? They're acidic. So when you buy peat moss, that pit moss, probably the pH is around 4, 4.5, 5. They're not, they're not very high pHs yeah? because the decomposition of organic matter releases protons. So that is a, a natural consequence that you acidify that material. All right. The, as, a, as a textbook definition, if it's really well decomposed and you cannot identify the plant material in it, you call it muck, yeah? If you can identify the original material, you call it peat, yeah? Now, in general, even the ones that you cannot identify, many are just calling peat all the time, not calling muck in general. Um, the type of plants that form uh, these type of materials, most of the time they are in subtropical climates 
It's moss material. Yeah? Have you heard about moss? You know what moss is? What is a moss? Let me go back to Google. Images. So this is a bryophyta type of plants. There's no non-flowering plants that they just grow a layer, then they grow a layer on top of it, and they grow another layer on top of it, and therefore the layers that are stained below, they are being very resistant to decomposition because of anaerobic conditions, okay? Um, let's go back. So these are typical from cold climates and wet climates. Yeah? Cold climates and wet climates. This is the type of landscape. Yeah? Flat, cold, wet, and as you form the accumulation of organic matter. Some of these soils are frozen by the, by the way, they call permafrost. Yeah? So there's a lot of organic matter trapped in frozen soils. And as you, as you thaw them up, they start decomposing again and emitting that carbon back to the atmosphere. Um, so that was it for parent materials. Okay, We have all the rocks, the weathering of rocks, the transport deposition of rocks, and there is where you get the formation of soils. Now there are other things you remember. There are other things that are also acting on the parent materials to form the soils. Yeah. Remember the seed port, yeah? Climate, parent material, organism, yeah? Climate, relief, and time, yeah? Climate, relief, and time. So let's talk about organisms. How do you say organisms affect the formation of soils? How do you think organisms are? acting on the material to develop that. We already talked about, go ahead. Reduce the size. Uh, produce, material. produce materials, produce organic materials, okay? They are depositing carbon on that and, sorry? Renewable of the soil. Renew, uh, how? Produce some materials to help the soil uh, maybe new. Okay, yeah, so they're creating more organic materials, depositing new organic materials in the soil. But most of the, of the situations, every time you have microbes, every time you have plants, they're actively conditioning the chemistry of the soil. They're releasing enzymes, they're releasing acids, they're changing the pH. Why are they doing that? For once, they want the minerals. So they are actively acting on the chemical weathering of the soils. So biological weathering is most of the time chemical weathering. They are actively acting on the minerals so they can take the nutrients out of the minerals. They are interested on growing, yeah? Selfish interest in growing. The minerals contain the elements they need for growth. They go there and decompose those minerals for their own selfish growth. As they do that, they are accelerating the formation of soils. Yeah? The organisms are accelerating the formation of soils actively by changing the chemistry. They release enzymes, they release organic acids, they change the pH, and uh, that's mostly it. Yeah? So the types of organisms that you will have here working on soil formation is vegetation, microbes, yeah? animals, and humans yeah this is a special topic here we could make a lecture only about anthropic soils how humans are forming soils yeah so what we described before vegetation and microbes they are changing the chemistry in the soil yeah animals i will put this aside so it can focus on the class so animals they are moving and burrowing and changing and mixing the soil. Yeah, earthworms, for example, uh, you know, burrowing animals, yeah, like 
ant walls, they are creating channels and mixing the soil. So not only is the chemistry, but also that effect of mixing. Humans, on the other hand, you have a whole lot of different other effects. You know? For example, we can actively create a soil just by making a terrace, for example. There are a whole a bunch of different types of human-made soils. We actively seek to form soils throughout our history because we are interested in agriculture. It's not only that we are plowing the soils and mixing them, but sometimes we are making these soils from scratch. There's nothing there. And then you start, you know, adding some material slowly because you're interested in growing stuff there. One of the examples we have, for example, uh, is in the Amazon forest. Indians on the past, thousands of years ago, they were actively adding charcoal to the soil to increase the soil fertility. They're making charcoal and they're adding charcoal for the soil. And the soils become more fertile because of that. Now, when you dig and describe the pedon, you have a clear cut where this the anthropic soil made by the Indians and the other soils were nearby, which is the same origin of parent material, but did not have the anthropic influence. Only the vegetation is one soil. Vegetation in humans is a different soil. Okay, so humans can change that if you put that over time and you can identify in some regions over thousands of years you will get that where the humans are acting upon the soil is a completely different soil where you do not have it. So this is called, we put it here together with organisms, but could be a different category completely, the anthropic formations of soils, yeah, anthropic soils. There are many different ways in, in, in which humans can affect. But every time we are doing agriculture or trying to use the soil for agriculture, this is most of the time where we create the soils. So here are examples where you have mixing of the soil by organisms. If you have a soil where there is no organisms that are mixing, probably the top soil will be only 15, 20 centimeters where the roots are mostly concentrated. But because you have earthworms or other organisms that are mixing the soil, you get a much thicker A horizon because of the, the action of these animals and insects. Next will be climate, relief, and time. Okay, climate, relief, and time. In order here, it's relief, not climate, yeah? What is the effect of relief? How do you think the relief, you understand relief, by the way? There's two components of relief, yeah? You have the slope, and you have the aspect. Yeah? Slope, it means high slope, very inclined, low slope, low, low inclination. Aspect is the orientation. The closer you are for the, the equators, the aspect is less important. It means that from both sides of a hill, you will get the same exposure of sunlight, uh, uh, condensation, yeah, you get similar conditions. But if you are further away in the north, it becomes more important that sometimes if you have a south facing side of the hill, it's completely different from the north facing. You will get completely different exposition for the elements. You know, the temperature will be different, the amount of shade and sunlight will be different in one side than in the other side. But as you get closer to the equator, you need to find special conditions. Now, even in Oman, you will see that if you go, for example, the mountains here, like you have Jabal Ahdar and Jabal Chams and so on, all the mountain, the hills, the side that is facing the coast will have a different exposure for, for the elements as you have on the other side, okay? So relief and climate are tightly related together. In one side you have more condensation because you have the moisture coming from the ocean and you have condensation. The other side would be drier. Yeah? 
So all of this is affecting a lot how the soils are being formed because there is a relationship between the aspect in the slope with the, um, what is happening on the soil. The other thing is about erosion, yeah? erosion in the position. So you have this different uh, components of a relief here called summit on the top of the hill, shoulder, back slope, two slope, and the alluvial valley on the bottom, or the floodplain, floodplain or alluvial valley. So what do you expect to see the type of soils happening on these types of landscape? On the top and the summit, yeah, on the summit here, probably you will find that the parent material is the rock. The rock, the, it's in situ soil formation because you're eroding this material. It's not a place where you have a likely to have strong deposits. Yeah? So if you have an underlying bedrock, most likely on the summit and on the back slope, you could have in situ formation of soils. So the soils are being formed from the composition of the rock that originates. Now, on the, on the summit, you probably have less erosion, so deeper soils. On the shoulder, you will have some erosion in shallower soils. Okay, So because of the erosion, also you get younger soils on the shoulder than you get on the summit. The back slope, you can start seeing some colluvial deposits and some soils formed over colluvial deposits deposited by gravity. Landslides from the past deposit this material over here and then you have some soil formation over this colluvial deposit. Two slope, the same thing, and alluvial material on the, on the bottom where it's coming from the river, yeah, the floodplain, where the river floods, then you get these depositions over here. So you get that because of that you have different maturity of the soils and different weathering and different types of horizons that you get in different uh, places of the relief. Yeah. When you study soils across a gradient of altitudes, that is usually what you call a catena. Yeah. A catena is a sequence of soils where the, the main difference is the altitude, you're changing, let's say if you go from the Albatina coast and you go up to the mountains, make a straight line and you study the soils, how they are changing. This is for soil scientists, this is called a catena, a sequence of soils where the topography is the main change. Together with the topography, you will also have changes in climate, in organisms, they are all interrelated, okay? So again, another representation of the relief and the formation of soils, the type of parent materials that you have. Climate, yeah? Climate, you have mainly two different elements that are conditioning this. These are <laughs> tired, yeah? Tired, very tired. Uh, the different elements from climate that the main ones are temperature and rainfall, precipitation, humidity, and you have temperature. The temperature, how does it work for the temperature? Let's talk first because of the temperature. Chemical reactions, weathering, chemical weathering is proportional to the temperature. Every 10 degrees, you increase the temperature. Every 10 degrees, the rate of the reactions double. The rate of the composition of rocks, the rate of growth, or the activity of enzymes, any chemical reaction, approximately, they double every 10 degrees. So if you have the average temperature of 20 degrees, and you have another place where the average, temper average, average temperature is 30 degrees, you will expect that the rate of soil formation is double because those chemical reactions are being accelerated by temperature. And so on and so forth. If you increase more, if you in increase 20 degrees, quadruple, yeah? It's quadruple. Double the first 10 degrees and then double again then the next 10 degrees. So Oman being a hot climate, 
the effect of, effect of temperature is an accelerator in soil formation. Now, precipitation is where Oman will be coming, having the problem. How does precipitation affect? It will condition everything else. Yeah? Chemical reactions happen in water. Yeah? This, the, the, there is an interface where chemical reactions happen. They're mostly happening in water. All those chemical weathering reactions that we are talking on the last lecture, they are occurring in water. Hydrolysis, oxidation, reduction reactions, yeah? dissolution. These are water-mediated reactions. So if you do not have moisture, the development becomes very, very slow. So in Oman, the soils are not well developed most of the time because they are dry. Yeah? They are dry soils. The indirect effect is the climate affects the organisms. If you have more rainfall, you get forests, you get a high occupation of deposits, organic materials, microbes, plants, animals. If you have a desert, then you, the amount of organisms that you have is much lower, and therefore these are also not acting on the parent material for the formation of soils. So this is indirect effect. But one of the things that you must consider is that it's not only the current climate. Right now, maybe the soil is very dry. But if you go there and you dig the soil and you make a pedum, it looks like a very well-defined soil, which has the effect of a lot of rainfall coming through the soil. And why? Because maybe that region a thousand years ago was a very wet region. It was a high rainfall. Imagine now that you have Salala, and maybe in a thousand years, Salala becomes like Muscat, dry, yeah? But Salala has more rainfall than here. But now the soils are being affected by the rainfall that you have in Salala at the moment. You have more monsoon. But maybe in the future, change of climates, and then it becomes a dry region. But if you go in the future and dig the soil, the soils may be reflecting what happened on the past, yeah? So it's not only the current climate. It's a little bit of a de detective work. Yeah? You have to go there and imagine what would have been the conditions in the past that led to the formation of those soils. So many times the climate is not the current climate, it's what was in the past. And the older the soil is, the more the past climate is relevant for the soil formation. Okay, we talked about temperature. The rate in she in doubles every 10 degrees, yeah? Conditions, organisms, yeah? The weathering is faster the more the temperature. Also, climates are conditioning the presence of different organisms. Uh, so these different landscapes that you can see here, they are mostly conditioned, but what type of climate you have on that region. Also, Higher animals will change easily from uh, one type of grassland for forest, so it, it could be an interaction between climate and the presence of higher animals here also. For example, if you have a lot of grazers, there's a tendency of forming more grasslands, and the soils formed under grasslands are different of the soils formed under forests. So let's say if you have a lot of um, uh, yeah, deer and other grazers that are just eating pasture, you tend to form more, you know, if, you, if those grazers disappear, then you have the more uh, formation of the forest in that same place. Precipitation, yeah, you have the precipitation is conditioning the soil moisture, the rate of decomposition, but also vertical transport inside the soil. We talked about the B horizon. The B horizon is a deposit horizon, and that B horizon only happens if there is water moving in the soil profile downwards. Yeah? So it's conditioning the soil formation not only by having a higher moisture for increasing the rate of decomposition, but also by internal transport and redistribution in the soil. Yeah? Time, time is the ultimate modulator. 
you have the same parent material, you have the same climate, same organisms, but if it's a recent parent material, it will be an underdeveloped soil. If you give it enough time, it will be a well-developed soil. So the time is the ultimate regulator for this. The same conditions kept all the same. You can have a very young soil or a very old soil. So you see here the appearance of the formation of the different horizons. And these horizons, over time, they are becoming thicker and more pronounced and more clear observed because of the continuous effect yeah, of these elements. This next slide here is just to highlight that things are linked together. We are trying to make those links. So topography and climate are changed. If you go up in the mountains, it's colder. There's less temperature. Down, it's hotter. If you go up in the mountains, maybe you have more condensation. So there is a, a difference between the climate, a relationship between climate and relief. Yeah? Parent materials also, if you are in the different parts of the topography, you have different parent materials. You have in situ soils formed from the bedrocks, colluvial materials, alluvial materials, uh, vegetation also related to topography, to climate. So all of that is not, is not easy to isolate one effect from the other. Yeah? We can try to isolate what is the sequence of parent materials, the sequence of topography, the sequence of vegetation, sequence of climate, but most of the time you cannot separate. Yeah? It's not easy to separate. The fact of the time, in some places you can separate. Yeah? This is called a chrono sequence. Yeah? Some places you have chrono sequences that are naturally formed. One example is glaciers. Glaciers are sometimes retreating back they are you know melting and they're retreating and that retreat has a steady pace the oldest material brought from the glacier maybe has you know 10,000 years the youngest one will have a thousand years or something like that and then in between you have a difference of time formation yeah at some point the glacier starting started retreating and uncovering material at different times so if you go there and sample you have a gradient of time, actually. How much, how long those materials were exposed for the formation under the same conditions. They have the similar conditions. Only thing was time is different. The effect of time sometimes can be observed in uh, coastal dunes. In Australia, there is a, one, of, one formation that is every time you have an earthquake, a lot of alluvial material goes into the ocean. The river brings all the rocks coming from the calcareous rocks, goes into the ocean. The ocean brings them back into the coast and form a dune formation. So over time, you have a new dune, another dune. The parent material is the same. So it's just forming layers and layers and layers of new coastal dunes, which are deposited over time. So if you look at this, the same parent material, that are deposited in different time scales, and what happened to that soil, you can see the effect of time on that. So this is called a chrono sequence, yeah? Chrono sequence. All the others you try to isolate, but they're very hard to separate from each other. Yeah? And thanks to this complexity of interactions, is that we have the complexity and beauty of different soil profiles. And if you go around the globe, thousands and thousands of different types of soils can be identified. And all of this diversity of soils and their unique properties are a consequence of these interactions that you see here. This was all for today. Questions?